From the book of Ruth, Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, I need to seek some security for you so that it may be well with you. Now here's our kinsman Boaz, with whose young women you have been working. See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Now wash and anoint yourself, and put on your best clothes, and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. She said to her, All that you tell me, I will do. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When they came together, the Lord made her conceive, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without next of kin, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her bosom and became his nurse. The women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse, the father of David. The word of the Lord. Unless the Lord builds the house, their labor is in vain who build it. Unless the Lord watches over the city, in vain the watchman keeps his vigil. It is in vain that you rise so early and go to bed so late. Vain, too, to eat the bread of toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Children are a heritage from the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is a gift. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. He shall not be put to shame when he contends with his enemies in the gate. A reading from the letter of the Hebrews. When Christ came as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy place, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls with the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer sanctifies those who have been defiled so that their flesh is purified, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to worship the living God? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus was teaching in the temple and he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses for the sake of appearance and for the sake of appearance, say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Then he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. 
many rich people put in large sums. But a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth about a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Grace to you and peace. Please be seated. Some days the most important thing we do is to stay faithful. Stay faithful. I am, um, if you are joining us today as a guest or if you are a woman, today is your day to be in church because we read from the little small book of Ruth, which you have probably passed over in your flipping through your Bibles because it's so short. It's scarcely four pages, three and a half pages long in most Bibles. It's tucked, it's tucked in just behind uh, the book of Judges um, in, in, in our Bibles. It is a wonderful little story which doesn't really have any players other than the ones in the family. It, it has, however, even though it is a story about a family, has been used liturgically by Hebrew-speaking peoples for almost two millennia. It is a story about being faithful in little things. A story about how being faithful in little things leads us to be faithful in bigger things. It is a story on which the Hebrew Jewish people have relied for almost 2,000 years to help direct us in the details of our faith. It's the book from which we get the little saying, those who are faithful in little things are faithful in big things. Um, I, uh, I'm not going to tell you the story of Ruth, by the way. I want, uh, purposely, I want you to go read it. It'll take you six minutes of your whole entire life. Um, so go do that. Um, I know that you have been reading the letter to the Hebrews. Uh, I know you've been reading it, as I've said before, because you come to me with these uh, questions about what in the world's going on in this book. <laughs> um, yes, there is a lot there to to, to um, digest. If you're reading, have been reading along with us since uh, roughly set the end of September, you're probably about where I am if you're sticking to the six verses a day. You're probably somewhere towards the end of chapter 11, beginning of of chapter 12. Um, you'll notice there's only 13 chapters in this book, so in this letter, so we're going to finish it this week uh, if you're reading along that schedule. You have, if you're that far along, have gotten to the most oft quoted, um, often quoted uh, piece of Hebrews uh, that you will ever hear. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. It's a wonderful statement. Uh, it speaks um, to a couple of things. Uh, one, it speaks to what God has done. It speaks to the bigger picture of life. What God has done is ha he has, she, depending on your theology, <laughs> has created us, sustains us, has saved us, and will see us through to the very end in eternalness that we cannot even comprehend. This is the larger notion of faith. It's the notion that's carried in our translation in the NRSV. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. There is another translation, though, in the Latin Vulgate, uh, est autem, autem fides, uh, also meaning faith, but more pointedly, the word that's used there is fidelity. Fides. Fidelity. Now, fidelity is different than just faith. Fidelity, now you probably know this word. 
You've probably heard this word as you grew up in the 60s and 70s. I'm sure all of you did. Like I, you learned this word like I did when they first came out with stereo systems that were called hi-fi. You remember this, right? Hi-fi. You know what hi-fi means? High fidelity, exactly. Do you know what it refers to? It refers to the accuracy of what it is producing, reproducing. So if you have a hi-fi system, then you are hearing things very accurately as almost exactly like when they were first produced. So fides, fidelity, is about the details. And the devil may be in the details, but then again, so is Jesus. The point that I'm trying to make is, is that faith is a wonderful thing, faith in God and the bigger picture. But when we are called to faith, we are called to pay attention to the details, the little things. Another wonderful translation of this little piece of scripture in, in Hebrews comes from uh, Eugene Peterson's The Message. The very fundamental fact of our existence is that this trust, this faith, is the foundation under everything that makes life worth living. These details to which we pay attention, to which we try to remain faithful, those things are the foundation of everything that makes life worth living. I uh, want to walk with you for a minute through the Gospel of Mark and lead us up to the widow's might. Um, the widow's might, as we read it in this lectionary cycle B that we're in now, uh, we, we do it a little unfairly. It's one of our gripes with our lectionary texts. They don't give us enough sometimes for us to get a sense of where it has come from or even where it is going. So I'm going to give you a brief synopsis of the Gospel, chapter 12 of the Gospel of Mark, so that you can know what territory we have covered. The Gospel of Mark begins with the parable of the wicked tenants, which you know that story very well. It's a story about how we as stewards become wayward and lost, and we reject the very key things of life. The next little story in the Gospel of Mark chapter 12 is the question from the scribes and the Pharisees to Jesus about taxes, which you also, to, to, what, to whom shall we pay our taxes? You remember this story. It's a story about how we get lured into disloyalty. The next little piece of the Gospel is the question from the Pharisees to Jesus about the resurrection. It's a story about how we are self-serving in our perceptions of what God has done, is doing, and where Scripture is leading us in that journey. The next little piece of the gospel is the question about David's son. It's a little, little snippet about the origins of life and how mysterious they are and how we rarely, scarcely can comprehend the whole thing. The next piece, as you heard this morning, is the denunciation of the scribes. Beware. It's a story about how we cannot always trust our motives. And then the, Scott, the 12th chapter of Mark ends with the widow's offering. It begins with people who have become wayward and lost and rejected the very foundation of life. And it ends with a poor woman who has found that life is defined by self-emptying and self-offering. You know, all of you, that we are going to today commission our callers and that they will begin to call each of us as we prayerfully consider what will be our role and our place as stewards over the next year. I know that many of us trust in God very deeply. 
And I know that we have notions of faith that transcend our life here, but let's not lose sight of where we are being led. God is responsible for things about which we cannot help. We cannot help that we find ourselves here, that we have been created. We cannot save ourselves. God has taken care of those things for us. We, however, are responsible for our own fidelity. We are responsible for those things that give meaning to our lives. I speak specifically about three things that I have been driving into our heads over the last few weeks. Um, those three things are prayer and scripture, our commitment to generosity, and our engaging in the world and its suffering, most, close, most particularly the suffering that happens close by. We are our faith aside in the bigger things, responsible for seeing to those things. But let's not get sidetracked. Let's not get caught up in the devil of the details. Yes, we are responsible for our own fidelity, but we do not take this responsibility in isolation. We do these things, as always, with God's help. Now, the story of the widow's mite has been used oftentimes to criticize the sacrificial system of the first century, the Jewish sacrificial system, a system that would allow a poor old widow to put her last two cents into a basket and therefore forfeit perhaps a meal or perhaps just a sip of wine or drink of any kind, or perhaps just a morsel of food. And I'm here to tell you, any system that requires of the poor to do such a thing is not worth following. However, what we don't know, and when people describe that situation like this, what we don't know is that there never was a time in the history of Israel in the Jewish sacrificial system or any other piece of it that required a widow to put anything in the treasury, poor or not. She was a widow. She was expected to be taken care of by the rest of of the community. So this is not a story about how bastardized, for lack of a better word, the sacrificial system is. This is a story about the very foundation and meaning of life. It is a story about a woman who gives more, just in two coins, gives more than everyone else. Because she gives out of her poverty. She gives, as Jesus says, her very bios, life. We give but little when we give of the things we have. But when we give of ourselves, we give everything. Oftentimes, this story, too, has been used for, uh, conveniently for us to say, well, whatever we offer back to God is okay. You remember the story of the widow's might and Jesus', Jesus positive comments about the widow. Okay, you can read it like that if you want. But do not forget that Jesus says she has given everything, her very livelihood. So the point is not that all of our little gifts, however small, are great in Jesus' sight. If they come out of your livelihood, then yes, they are. But if they do not, then we have some praying to do. And you could say, too, that yes, None of us is able to give perfectly, and none of us can, I won't, give everything. You could say this, and it would be exactly true. But perfecting 
of the gifts and perfection in general is not our business. That is God's business. Our business is to participate in the life and in the grace that we have been gifted. Gifted. I said to you that um, some days the most important things we will do, most important thing we will do is to stay faithful. This is a difficult thing, staying faithful. It is found, this faithfulness, this trust in the very foundation of our life is found in the little things that we do. Let's not forsake life by being scared of what we don't have or how little we can only give. Live, live as if abundance was a gift from God. And believe me, brothers and sisters, in the American world, it is. Now, the fundamental fact of our existence is that this trust in God, this faith, is the foundation under everything that makes life worth living. Be faithful. Amen. If you please stand. We believe in one God, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God, that we may turn to you for guidance and direction as we strive to serve one another and the church with the gifts you have entrusted to our care. Open our hearts, O Lord. To serve you with joy. That we may more easily choose to serve rather than to be served, to give rather than to take, to contribute rather than to consume. Open our hearts, O Lord. That we may learn to trust you more deeply, to provide us with all that we need and to sustain our lives. Open our hearts, O Lord. That we may learn to see the difference between the simple things we need and the many things we want. Open our hearts, O Lord. That we may recognize the many blessings the poor and the needy bring to us, even as we seek to share our blessings with them. Open our hearts, O Lord. 
that we, may come, that we may come to realize more fully that everything we have is a gift from you and that we are called to share these gifts generously with all who are in need. Open our hearts, O Lord. That we may learn to see ourselves as your beloved children who have been called to work in your kingdom and to spread your love throughout the world. Open our hearts, O Lord. That we, may, that we may find more time to pray, to give thanks for all of our blessings, and to ask for your guidance in the right use of the gifts entrusted to our care. Open our hearts, O Lord. That as we look upon the world, we may see the unseen, love the unlovable, and bind up the brokenhearted wherever we find them. Open our hearts, O Lord. That through our good stewardship, we may build up your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. Open our hearts, O Lord. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. Almighty and ever-living God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, hear our prayers for this parish family. Strengthen the faithful, arouse the careless, and restore the penitent. Grant us all things necessary for our common life, and bring us all to be of one heart and mind within your holy church, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray to you, O God, for the forgiveness of our sins. <clears throat> Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone, and so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. May Almighty God grant us forgiveness of all our sins and the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand. Peace of the Lord be always with you.